The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the Progressive Army. Welcome to the Benjamin Dixon Show. I am your host, Benjamin Dixon. Today is Wednesday, January 22nd, 2020. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, We are broadcasting live for the purposes of taking live calls. You can call in to our number, 678. Uh, I had, I don't know the number quite yet. Uh, 678-701-3391. And joining the conversation, usually somewhere around 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I will be recording live on YouTube. And you can participate in the conversation. Again, the number is 678-701-3391. Now, as I started talking about a few seconds ago, but I realized I wasn't recording, <laughs> is the fact that in 2020, 2019, 2018, Hell, ever since 2016, I have done my level best to not be um, to not be divisive, to make sure that we can unite, to make sure that we have the ability to um, unify behind whoever was going to be the eventual nominee in 2020. I have used my entire platform, both on Twitter, both on YouTube, everywhere that I you have heard my voice. I have done everything that I could to make sure that we don't go into the divisiveness of 2016. And to my error, I believe my mistake has also been to um, kind of lay the bulk of my criticisms at the feet of the Bernie crowd. And it's not for any other reason, but besides uh, the fact that I hold my side more accountable. um, And that's just generally how I live. I have higher expectations of people that I roll with, right? And so most of my criticisms has been an, an issue of Bernie Sanders supporters. Let's not do anything that's going to make uh, 2020 hard for us to unify. I'm, I'm guilty of that. Well, yesterday, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Hillary Clinton made a fool out of me and everyone else who tried to make sure that we could unify by uh, announcing uh, through through an interview that she's going to actually a documentary that she is going to be participating in or releasing in March a documentary about her life and a documentary about her run for the presidency. Uh, she has inserted into the equation, the most divisive rhetoric that could possibly ever be inserted. Yesterday, she said that nobody likes Bernie Sanders. Nobody likes him. Nobody wants to work with them. Uh, according to political.com. Um, this is what she says in her upcoming forthcoming documentary quote. He was in Congress for years. He had one Senator support him. Nobody likes him. Nobody wants to work with him. He got nothing done, Clinton said in a four part series entitled Hillary. Um, He was a career politician. It's all just baloney. And I feel so bad that the people got sucked into it. Um, I don't know what to say about this woman other than there's something really wrong with her. Now, she has since come out uh, and there's no need to be fair to her because this is her doing But she has since come out and try to make light of what's coming out about what's coming out in her documentary. And she said this on Twitter, quote, I thought everyone wanted my authentic, unvarnished views. But to be serious, the number one priority for our country and the world is retiring Trump. And as I as as I have always said, I will do whatever I can to support our nominee. Now, what she said on Twitter actually contradicts what she said uh, in the upcoming documentary, because in the documentary, She made it clear that she didn't want to discuss the possibility of her having to support Bernie Sanders because we don't want to go there. This is too soon. We don't know how it's going to work out, essentially paraphrasing her. This has given life to the Hillary versus Bernie wars that I fought so hard against in 2016 and ever since. And it is 100 percent the fault of Hillary Clinton and no one else and her supporters. And if this has any bearing on um, our ability to unify after the primaries are over, it is nobody's fault but Hillary Clinton. Because what they're asking of us as supporters of Bernie Sanders is for us to be magnanimous when they're being petty. What they're asking of us is for us to be above the fray when they're hitting below the belt. They're asking for us while they are reveling. I mean, all of her surrogates, all of her uh, Twitter supporters, all of her, all of them reveled in the pettiness of Hillary Clinton when in actuality, what's going to happen in response to this is if and justifiably so, if you think about it, people would be able Bernie Sanders supporters would be able 
to look legitimately at whoever the nominee is and say, I won't support that person because of this. It's something that I don't want to see happen because ultimately we do have to get rid of Donald Trump. But but you are asking too when when the person who caused the wound comes back and throws and pours salt in the wound, you can't expect people to be above the fray. You can't expect people to go above and beyond and to do something that nobody else is uh, that they wouldn't do themselves. I mean, the level of pettiness, the level of grandstanding, the level of posturing has been sickening. And yet you expect Bernie Sanders supporters to fall in line and to just uh, support whoever the nominee is, especially if it's somebody that is supported by Hillary Clinton, who is a proxy for Hillary Clinton. It doesn't work like that. You have to, the reason I was so adamant. The reason I was so adamant about um, about Bernie Sanders supporters not making it impossible to unify with the eventual nominee is because we need their supporters. We need Biden supporters. We need Buttigieg supporters. We need Warren supporters to actually win. That's why I always held the position that I held. But now we're in a situation where Hillary Clinton has stirred up the Hillary versus Bernie wars so much so that her supporters are running out here and grandstanding to the point where People would rather not support the nominee simply because of the behavior of Hillary Clinton supporters and Hillary Clinton herself. That sounds mighty familiar, right? Because that's literally what they have criticized us for. They criticize Bernie Sanders supporters for behaving poorly. Well, here is not not this is not Bernie behaving poorly. This is Hillary Clinton behaving poorly. The most arguably still one of the most powerful women in politics engaging in the most petty and futile and fatuous examples of politics imaginable. And so obviously, you know, her sycophants, her supporters are going to run wild and behave the same way. Now, uh, a lot of this hinges on people's assumption that are, are erroneous, actually just flat out lie in their belief that Bernie Sanders did not support Hillary Clinton after the primaries, right? That's still the ongoing lie. That's still the ongoing, um, well, I don't have any better way to describe it than a lie. Um, my friend, uh, Matt Binder, who has a podcast, I'll put a link. Uh, he shared this on Twitter, basically showing that anyone who's still saying that is, you know, in my words, um, un- they are ungrateful bastards because it is, in fact, the case that Bernie Sanders energetically endorsed. I, matter of fact, I remember the day. I remember the day Bernie Sanders came out in support for Hillary Clinton. His first announcement conceding the primaries. And I said to myself, self, if I was Bernie Sanders, I'd come out here and I'd just be petty and just say three words. I endorse Hillary and walk off the stage. <laughs> Bernie didn't do that. Bernie got on stage and he gave the um, the most sincere and full-throated endorsement that you can possibly imagine him giving for Hillary Clinton. And not only that, he went on the campaign trail, I think almost 30 times. I'm just guesstimating at this point, but almost 30 times to support Hillary Clinton. Matt Binder um, put together this compilation. And uh, so take a listen to this. And you tell me who's being untruthful about whether or not Bernie actually supported Hillary Clinton in a meaningful way. Hillary was the nominee in 2016, and the only people in hindsight who think that Bernie did a lot for her or enough for her is Bernie and his supporters. He didn't stand up for Hillary or have her back or campaign for her, I think, as vigorously as he could have. Hillary Clinton must become the next president of the United States. There is one candidate who believes that the wealthy should start paying their fair share of taxes, and that is Hillary Clinton. If you don't believe that this election is important, if you think you can sit it out, take a moment to think about the Supreme Court justices that Donald Trump would nominate. 
there was this lingering question at the end of the Democratic primary as to whether or not Bernie Sanders really meant it when he endorsed Hillary Clinton, whether he really meant it when he said he would work his heart out all over the country to get her elected. Well, he's been working his heart out, it's true. He started campaigning for Clinton basically as a full-time gig. He appears really to be flooring it for Hillary Clinton. Over five days, he did 14 events for her. I served with her in the United States. So there it is. Um, again, that compilation was put together by Matt Binder on Twitter at Matt Binder, host of the Doomed Podcast, uh, doomedpod.com. Go ahead and check him out. Um, so Bernie Sanders, campaign event after campaign event after campaign event, supported Hillary Clinton with a full throated endorsement. Even if he hadn't, Hillary Clinton at this juncture has twice in this campaign cycle um, inserted herself into the conversation for no other reason, but her, her own self aggrandizement. Right? So even if Bernie Sanders was guilty of what she accused him of, which he's not, she is inserting herself into the national conversation for the purposes of promoting her. Um, I think the first time it was her appearance on the Howard Stern show, but this time is to promote her documentary. So at the expense of the national conversation and the possibility of us having another four years of Donald Trump, she was like, who cares? Yeah, she said, who cares? Essentially, who cares that in order for me to promote my program, my my documentary, the cost of it very well may be the inability of the Democratic Party to unite behind any candidate. That's a level of selfishness. That's a level of self-aggrandizement. That's a level of uh, callous disregard to the importance of the time that is not becoming. You want petty? It's not becoming of a president, which is exactly why she's not president of the United States. If you want petty. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon show. Well, all right. Special thank you to all of our patrons for making this show possible. Um, Special shout out to Penelope. Penelope, who increased their pledge. Thank you so much. We're asking all of our patrons if you just increase your pledge by a dollar, um, that will make a significant difference. Special thank you to Derek Sparks for increasing your pledge. Thank you, my friend. Special thank you to Joseph for becoming a new patron. You, sir, are the real MVP. Uh, Special thank you to William Gordon Jr. for increasing your pledge. You, too, can become a part of this prestigious and prodigious, prodigious patron family by going to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and becoming a patron now. Okay, so let me before I play this next clip, I want to make something abundantly clear. There's not a show that you're going to find that has taken more painstaking steps to be fair and balanced. I hate to use a Fox News term, but it's factual. And criticizing the candidate that I support, Bernie Sanders, while trying to ensure that my audience, as well as anyone that's in my purview, um, is reasonable and will be able to unify after the fact. The reason I'm saying this is because there's a knee jerk reaction, which is disingenuous, that a lot of anti Bernie, never Bernie people have that they bring to the conversation. They always bring it to the conversation that we are being disingenuous, that we are not being reasonable, that we are the ones who are muddying the waters and we are the ones that are going to make it impossible. Well, there may very well be, let me finish that last sentence, impossible to unite after the primaries. That very well may be the case for some Bernie supporters, right? I'm not a fan of the cult of personality in any, in, for anyone, not for Bernie Sanders. I'm not that big of a supporter of Bernie Sanders because of his personality at all. I'm a supporter of Bernie Sanders because of his policies, but that's besides the point. I digress. The point is you will not find another show, another podcast that has been um, as thorough in holding my side accountable while trying to ensure that we give the other side the benefit of the doubt. And the reason I start this segment with that is because as I get ready to play this clip, It is a clip that looks as though it is attacking is it is an attack ad against Joe Biden when, in fact, it is simply stating the facts. It is a clip that Bernie Sanders has put together, but it is a clip that's stating the facts. And what we're not going to do, what I would never do 
is allow people to throw us in this into this asymmetrical fight where we're not able to point out factual problems with other candidates because you want us to be nice when every time we turn around, you are you are attempting to politically disembowel us. So here's a clip of the facts about Joe Biden, who and I'll talk about the the corruption, the corruption piece in a minute, the corruption article. Um, that Bernie Sanders apologized for. And a lot of people don't agree with him apologizing. I'm going to talk about that next. But right here, I want to play this clip because I think it's the most important clip for us to hear that Joe Biden is not the person that we need on critical issues. And that's not an attack ad. That is an historical fact. Listen in. When I argued that we should freeze federal spending, I meant Social Security as well. I meant Medicare and Medicaid. I meant veterans benefits. I meant every single solitary thing in the government. And I not only tried it once, I tried it twice, I tried it a third time, and I tried it a fourth time. Well, we've got some bad news for them. We are not going to cut Social Security. We're going to expand. <laughs> Simple as that. Here's Joe Biden's problem. He has a track record. He has a very long track record that takes him out of the height of neoliberal centrist democratic policies, where it was the popular thing to do to try to position yourself as the person that's going to cut benefits, that's going to cut Social Security, to try to position yourself as the conservative, as the fiscal conservative. Remember when it was all the rave to say I'm liberally, uh, socially liberal, but fiscally conservative. That is the exact era that that Joe Biden uh, hails from. That's where he came from. That's where he made his hay. And so we have clip after clip after clip that shows you that that Joe Biden will absolutely go after Social Security. He absolutely will go after Medicaid. He absolutely will go after um, uh, uh, all of our safety nets. With his own words. And so the problem that he's facing is a similar problem that B- Pete Buttigieg is facing. And this is what I mean by that. The problem that Joe Biden is facing is that he's trying to become president of the United States at a time when the electorate has shifted significantly. You cannot say that you are going to cut Medicaid and cut Social Security and be a viable candidate right now in the Democratic Party. But Joe Biden made his hay during the era where that was the thing to do and say. Similarly, with Pete Buttigieg, he (laughs) which is a a lot uh, so much more irony here. Pete Buttigieg crafted his his entire resume off of what it would take to be a popular president, Democratic president in the 90s. He went to the military and all served so that he could put that as a badge of honor and now on his resume, rather. And now most of America is like, we really don't care if you served because that doesn't distinguish you as someone um, more significant than anyone else in the conversation. In fact, We have a problem with American imperialism and you willingly participated in it when you didn't have to. You had no economic reason, need to join the military, uh, to be a part of the middle class. You had no need to do that. And so we're not impressed by it. In fact, we're turned off by it. We're not impressed by this. We are indeed turned off by it. And so Joe Biden has a similar problem to Pete Buttigieg is that they're both Joe Biden made his hay. We have too many accounts of Joe Biden's attack on our safety nets in a time where we're not attacking the safety nets. No, we're demanding that that corporations and billionaires pay their fair share so that we can expand the safety net. You are not we're not in an era where you can remotely talk about cutting Medicaid and Medicare when we have shifted the Overton window to the point where you have to talk about Medicare for all. So that's the problem that Joe Biden has. And it's not even about political posturing, right? As I'm phrasing it, it's not about political posturing. It's genuinely about what type of policies would Joe Biden institute if he were to be elected president of the United States? And based on everything that he has proudly suggested in the past, and we have video for, he would cut Social Security, he would cut Medicare and Medicaid, and he would be as tough on crime as Republicans ever dreamed of. These are the things that Joe Biden bragged about. And this is why he is this is why he's decidedly not fit to be president of the United States. It has nothing to do with Bernie Sanders. It has nothing to do with anybody else. It has to do with with Joe Biden based on his own words. All right. 
So this is not news per se, but it is per, uh, it is relevant to what's happening in the news. So yesterday, uh, Bernie Sanders apologized for an article that was written by one of his surrogates um, claiming that Joe Biden has a corruption problem. Bernie Sanders came out and said that it's not true that Bernie, uh, that Joe Biden doesn't have a corruption problem. Here's here's the interesting thing about this. I got into an argument last night with a friend um, and we argued till about, I don't know, damn near one o'clock in the morning. And it was over whether or not it is reasonable for us to compare what Joe Biden did with what Donald Trump did. Now, on the face of it, I don't care, to be quite honest with you. The reason I don't care is because, well, hell, I just don't care. I care about the impeachment proceedings in terms of the historical significance of it. I do care about the impeachment proceedings because I believe if the Democrats had not commenced the impeach, I'm sorry, right now we're at the impeachment trial, but if the Democrats, if the House had not um, drawn up articles of impeachment for Donald Trump, it would have been an abdication of their responsibility. And in a way, it would have been an expansion. It would have it would have tacitly expanded Donald Trump or any president in the future, their ability to behave in this manner because they would have set the precedent of not holding that president accountable for this type of behavior, the quid pro quo, right? So those are the reasons that I care about the impeachment proceedings. But one of the main reasons I don't cover it um, in every painstaking details that you get a lot of other media outlets covering it is because um, we know the results. We know how it's going to end, right? And so at this point, it's just a matter of them going through the machinations, going through the processes that are necessary to get it on the record that the House of Representatives objected to the behavior of Donald Trump. Right. And they they have gotten it on the historical record through articles of impeachment that they firmly believe, based on all their evidence, that there was obstruction of justice and that there was abuse of authority, abuse of power. So those are the reasons that I care. The reason I don't care is because it's all in the bag for Donald Trump anyway. So last night I got into this argument with a friend. And uh, it was over whether or not we can draw an, uh, an equivalence between what Joe Biden did and what um, Donald Trump did. Which unfortunately made me actually dig into the Burisma story, um, into the Hunter Biden story. And, and the reason I say reluctantly and I didn't really want to dig into it is because, again, I don't care because on the surface of it, the nepotism, the nepotism alone is reason for me to be like, OK, champ. This is you. There's literally no reason you got this job other than the fact that your father was the vice president of the United States. Right. So at a minimum, it is absolutely nepotism for sure. Right. But you can't draw an equivalence between what Joe Biden did to what uh, Donald Trump did for a couple of key reasons. When you dig into the story itself, you find out that there is a year and a half difference between the time that Hunter Biden was appointed to the board and between the time that Joe Biden insisted that the Ukrainian prosecutor be removed from office for corruption. And the accusation that has been forwarded by Republicans in order to draw this false equivalence is that uh, Joe Biden sought and received a quid pro quo. He got this for that. And the this was his son got a job on this board and that that was for firing this prosecutor. But that's not the case because what happened first, Hunter Biden got on the board a year and a half. If you want the dates, I can pull up the dates for you, but it, it feels tedious because the, of the disingenuousness of the arguments. It's like pointing out a factual, it's pointing out the facts to people who really don't give a damn about the facts, right? That's why. I oftentimes will not engage in these type of arguments because the people on the other side of the equation have no intention of engaging in good faith whatsoever. All right. So if you want the dates, here are the actual dates. Hunter Biden got the job um, on the board of Burisma and he got the job on May 13th, 2014. That's when they announced that he was joining the board. Joe Biden did not call for the firing of Victor Shokin until December of 2015. That is damn near a year and a half later. 
So if you want to call Joe Biden out for his son taking advantage of his namesake, yeah, I mean, it's clearly nepotism. But you can't draw an equivalence between what Joe Biden did a year and a half after his son got the job to what Donald Trump did, which was a direct quid pro quo, which he said, I'm not going to release this military aid to Ukraine until they investigate Joe Biden. You also can't compare the two because they are magnitudes of order different, right? The impact of what Donald Trump was holding the military aid from Ukraine for his political personal advantage and the position that he put um, not only our relationship with the Ukraine, with Ukraine, our relationship in the region, our interest in the region, but the people of Ukraine, right? The risk that he put them in simply for the purposes of his political power. And then most importantly, most importantly, he is the sitting, he is the sitting president of the United States of America engaging in this behavior. And so for people to draw that false equivalence, I understand that from conservatives because that's exactly what they're going to do. They're always going to do that. But when people who are ostensibly on our side of the argument draw that false equivalence, I think we have to engage in good faith and say there is a difference. You can dismiss the difference. You can ignore the difference, but you have to at least acknowledge the difference that there was no quid pro quo with Joe Biden because what he asked the Ukrainian government to do did not occur until a year and a half later than the point where his son got the job. The other reason I don't want to talk about this story is because you put me in the unfortunate position of having to defend Joe Biden. And I don't want to spend my day defending someone that under any circumstances does not need to be the president of the United States. But here we are, uh, me having to defend Joe Biden because my job description is to call out the BS wherever I see it. Caller, you are live on the air. What is your name, comment, and or question? My name is Jamie from Indiana. Hey. Pixie on the moon in chat. Hey, Jamie, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Dr. I um, wanted to derail the conversation a little bit and talk about my appreciation for you and your show oh. and how careful you are with ableist language. I've not noticed any other progressive commentators that care that much and, you know, kind of wash themselves. So thank mm. you for caring about disabled people. Um, actually it's my pleasure. And to be honest with you, um, so the reason I'm careful is because I'm surrounded by friends who insist on me being careful. Right. Um, it, it didn't come naturally to me. Um, but when I saw how important it was to the friends that surrounded me, it became important to me just like, um, even on other issues I have had to evolve, um, on trans issues. I had friends who hammered me to the paint. They would not let me off the ropes until I saw where they were coming from. And eventually I, I did. And I saw the necessity of it. I saw how it wasn't asking too much of me to acknowledge someone else's, um, someone else's um, identity. And in this case, to acknowledge that the language that we use can be harmful to other people. Um, and so it is a task because I would tell you, it is so easy to describe the nature of our politics right now based on our using rather ableist language. And so uh, it is a constant task. But um, thank you for the call. And always I, I want the audience to always hold me accountable in that way. Thank you, Ben. Bye-bye. My pleasure. 678-701-3391 if you want to join the conversation. Caller, you are live on the air. What is your name, comment, and or question? Hey, Ben, it's Nick from Oregon. Nick, how are you, sir? Good to have you on the show. I'm doing all right. So I wanted to ask real quick. Uh, first, have you seen that new, uh, I think, morning consult poll that just came out like 20 minutes ago? Yes. It's actually, I think I saw it. Uh, let me make sure it's the right one that I saw. 
Um, but continue. Go ahead while I look it up real quick. Yeah, uh, Bernie up, I think, to 27% yeah. above Biden nationally for the first time. And Joe yeah. Biden at like 24%, I think. Something like that. Yeah. So I uh, a question that I see a lot from like, mm, I would say more uh, passionate progressives um, is the whole concept of Warren needing to drop out in order to. Oh, okay. Did I lose you? OK, I think we lost the caller. But Nick was talking about the, the new polling data that just came out and um, I'll run the numbers down for you. Uh, OK, so here's the new data that the caller was just speaking about. Bernie Sanders uh, is at 27 percent. Joe Biden is at 24 percent. Warren is at 14 percent. Buddha Judge is at 11 uh, percent. And if I heard the caller correctly before he was getting off, he was suggesting um, that more ardent supporters of Bernie um, are calling for uh, Elizabeth Warren to drop out. Um, I can't I don't know where he was going to go with that comment, but here's why um, here's an argument for that. Here's an argument against that. That's the best I can do with this is that number one, um, you're not guaranteed that if Elizabeth Warren drops out, that those supporters are going to come to Bernie Sanders. And that could be enough to shore up those three points that Joe Biden has um, that Joe Biden is in a deficit in. In other words, if Warren drops out and any number, if three percent, three points of those go to um, Biden. And three points don't go to uh, Bernie Sanders, then that actually props up Joe Biden in a way. So um, I honestly don't believe that we should assume that. I mean, we can look at the second pick. There is data out there saying who is your second pick. But that honestly, that changes. That changes pretty regularly. Hell, that changed for me. For me personally, Elizabeth Warren was my second pick until last week. And now she's no longer my second pick. My second pick is Tom Steyer. Right. Um, but for everybody who's supporting Warren, where are they this week? Right. We can't just assume that if they drop out, if uh, Elizabeth Warren drops out, that they are all going to go to Bernie Sanders. Um, not in the lay of the land, not not with what Hillary Clinton pulled yesterday, not with um, not with so much bitterness and so much determination by the political establishment to make sure that uh, Bernie Sanders never becomes president with that with that incentive. And that at stake, we should not assume that um, Elizabeth Warren dropping out would be something a net positive uh, for Bernie Sanders. I'm not sure if that's where the caller was going, but based on the data and how he set it up before I lost his call, um, that is what I would draw from that. OK, everyone, thank you for joining me. Those of you who joined me live um, in the live chat um, on YouTube. Again, this is the sausage making factory. You get to see exactly how I put the podcast together. Uh, but more importantly, you get a chance to call in uh, to our new number, which is 678-701-3391. So be sure to be uh, available to join the conversation starting tomorrow. And I will see you next time. Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon Show. If you like this episode, be sure to share, like, and subscribe.